Hi, um, I'm Nicole Andre with the uh, Saskatchewan Ministry, and I have Carl Lehman with me. Um, so we're going to just do the update from Saskatchewan. I'm going to talk a little bit about our chip seal program and what we've been doing there in the last few years, and then talk a little bit about our pavement performance models. Um, so just to kind of give you a feel for our context uh, around what pavement preservation looks like in Saskatchewan, um, talk a little bit about our roads and our traffic volumes. Um, so we're the purple province in the top corner there. Um, so this is what we look like. Those are our pavements. Um, some of the other roads on there, uh, we also take care of a lot of gravel surface provincial highways. Um, so there's a lot of kilometers of roads and really low volumes. So for us, something that has like an 8,000 vehicles a day, that would be our highest traffic volume that we would look after. Um, so we have, we categorize our pavements into three different networks um, and that's kind of how they're defined there. And uh, so this is center line kilometers or center line miles. So there's a lot of, a lot of road. <laughs> And we have about uh, similar um, inventory of gravel surface and, and thin, uh, thin, I guess, dust-free roads. Okay, so um, just a little bit about chip seals. So we, we were doing chip seals in kind of like the 80s and the 90s, and then when the high float emulsion technology came in, we switched over to uh, moving away from chip seals and doing a graded aggregate seal. And so this is just a, a picture of what those kind of look like. So there's a lot of dust in there, like up to seven, eight, nine, ten percent fines even. Um, so, and those were very economical for us to do and they work well in the, the low traffic volumes, but once you get, you know, up over 1,500 or 2,000 vehicles a day, we had a lot of problems with flying stones and things like that. So. Um, we just kind of quit doing them on our high, higher, higher volume roads. Um, so there's quite a few years that sort of went by where we just weren't sealing our higher volume roads. Um, so in 2010 we decided we wanted to get back into doing chip sealing. And so we did a pilot uh, project. Uh, we did a bunch of different types. We did some fiber uh, reinforced seals, some single chips, some raked in or racked in chip seals. And uh, so those were, those were quite successful and they're still performing today, they're, um, they're doing well. And it um, took us a few years to write some specifications, um, but we finally got that done. And we were able to tender some work in 2013, uh, so we did 88 kilometers then. Uh, 2014 we tendered work, but our contractor in Saskatchewan we quit sealing on all, August 31st, um, just because the weather starts getting cold. So, um, and our contractor showed up. He had five days to do um, about 100 kilometers, and so we said, "No, just go home." So, um, our uh, our seal contractors are both out of Alberta. We have uh, two contractors that are coming into the province to do to do this work for us. Um, so, and this year we caught up. So we let we tendered more work, and then we the contract from 2014. Uh, we were able to do quite a few of those roads. Some of them we swapped out uh, because they're kind of a little bit too far gone uh, for sealing, um, but he ended up doing the same volume of work. Um, so we got a lot down this year. So, um, And we're planning to, to really ramp up this program now in the next few years. So that's been a success for us. Um, I just wanted to talk about, uh, this is a picture I took last year when we were in uh, Minneapolis of uh, the chip seal with the fog coat on it. And uh, I really liked that idea and I took it back. And uh, with the contracts that we tendered this year, we, we put fog down on all of them. Um, and so that's a picture I took on the Trans-Canada Highway a few weeks ago of uh, what our, our version of the fog chip seal looks like. So we're hoping we'll see some some a little we've had some issue with uh, snowplow damage, um, so we're hoping the the fog will kind of help us a bit with that, and uh, it just looks really good. Like um, it's uh, the public really likes the look of that as well. So 
I tried doing some conversions on costs. So even with the fog code, our uh, 2015 contracts were cheaper than our 2014 contract because our contractors were sort of sh sharpening their pencils a little bit on price. Um, so it didn't actually cost us more to do the fogging. And uh, yeah, so I kind of converted Canadian, American meters squared to yards. So that's, that's roughly, uh, I think, <laughs> the equivalent cost uh, would be. So yeah, so I'm just going to talk a little about our pavement model. So we don't use a pavement condition index. Um, we use uh, we use two types of models. We use probabilistic models to work out um, our budgets and our performance targets uh, for condition, and then we use a deterministic model to work out uh, project selection and prioritizing which which roads are the best candidates uh, to be treating. And so we use three distresses in our models. So we have something we call seal score, which is um, kind of combines some cracking and some surface di distress, um, things like uh, segregation and stripping, and um, to work out uh, where we should be doing sealing. And then we have uh, the rutting measurements um, and IRI. Uh, so the seal scores are helping us work out where those seals should go down, and the rutting is we're usually targeting uh, those distresses with uh, either microsurfacing or uh, thin lift overlays, which would be uh, for us like under 30 millimeters, uh, probably about an, an inch. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so the way our models work, um, we uh, classify our our pieces of road uh, with different condition states. Um, so if it's good for rutting ride and for the seal score, then it's a condition state one. And then so we have these different combinations. Uh, so we have up to eight condition states. So um, as you go up, uh, things get worse. So condition state eight is all poor. Um, so different combinations. So then in our model, what we are working out is um, predicting how much of our network would go from a that is good right now would go from a good condition state to a poor condition state for each distress. Um, so that's, that's kind of how the probabilistic models work. Um, and then when we look at uh, applying uh, the, our uh, project level modeling uh, for every condition state, we have a uh, target treatment that we would put down on that, on that road. Um, so, uh, just for example there, condition state five has poor rutting, has good ride, and then um, it has good seal score. So that'd be a perfect uh, microsurfacing treatment. And then we also do a treatment uh, where if we have poor rutting and, and poor seal score, we'll just do a rut fill with the microsurfacing and then do, do a seal. Um, depending on traffic volume, it'd be a chip seal or it would be a um, graded aggregate seal over top. And so we have to kind of, that one gets a little tricky because you have two different contractors coming in to do the work. So um, you have to get the timing going there for that. Um, yeah. So uh, just to give you a bit of a feel for what our strategies look like. Um, so sorry I didn't convert some of this, but a good IRI is anything that has a, a better than 2.25, which is meters per kilometer, and I have no idea what that translates into. <laughs> but, um, and the ruts is 10 millimeters. So we would work out a five-year target of what we want those conditions to be for that network. Um, so this is going into 2015. We have our target set for, for the year 2020. Um, and for our level service, one network is in pretty good shape. Uh, Right now, actually, our, like our, our ride, for example, is at 94% of that network has good, good ride. And we're actually going to uh, reduce the quality of our ride for that network down to 93%. Um, and we're, we're actually um, shifting that money to our level service two and level service three networks because um, they, they kind of desperately need it compared to uh, our higher volume roads. Um, so that's kind of what our strategies look like. And I think I pass it over to Carl. Oh, yeah, sure. I'll talk about this. Um, 
Yeah, so this is just an example of um, after we get through the strategy development uh, and we kick into picking projects, uh, we end up with um, just ranking those projects uh, for benefit and benefit in terms of um, if you do this type of treatment, what would the improvement to the condition be? And then the cost of doing that treatment. And uh, then we just kind of rank them and we, and we start working at the top uh, as far as going out and looking in the field and uh, confirming that that's a good project to be doing. Okay, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about how we arrive at some of the inputs for our models. As Nicole mentioned, we do probabilistic modeling to generate a strategy. And then we use a more deterministic model to, to actually choose projects after the fact. Um, previously, uh, all of our model inputs had been sort of what, what we call engineering judgment. There's a, a room full of people would get together and then have a long debate about what the likelihood of a segment going from one state to another is and so on. And it was uh, not very defensible. Uh, so we wanted to make a move towards something a little bit more evidence-based. Uh, we started on the probabilistic models, and what you see on this chart is uh, um, basically year-over-year -year likelihoods of a, a given segment on a given piece of road going from a good state uh, for one of those one of those values, either IRI, rutting, or seal score. So the likelihood of a segment moving from good to poor uh, in one year. We basically arrived at this by taking all of the segments that were in good condition in year one all of the segments that were in good condition in year two and dividing those out. I mean, it's just that simple. Um, so what the line that you see then is over a series of five transitions or five you know, year one to year two pairs. Uh, what we end up doing is actually just averaging it out over that period and giving us something that's a little bit smoother than, than a, a big change over time. Um, we actually end up doing it by the surface area, but it, it just basically works out to something that we can then trace back. And when the questions ask, why did you use that probability? We can say that's because that over the last five years, that's what the evidence showed us our network does. So we do that for the rutting and for the IRI. We're still working on how to do it for that seal score metric because that's a little bit less well known and a little bit more subjective. Um, when we get into the uh, deterministic modeling that we do to actually select treatments, we need something that will uh, tell us what the actual curve year over year, uh, the change in condition of that treatment is going to look like. After you apply that treatment, how is it going to deteriorate over time? Uh, so what we ended up doing was digging into our database and finding locations where, where a certain classification of treatment, in this case we're looking at what we call a heavy family treatment. That's any kind of repaving basically, uh, to put it in simple terms. Uh, the way this chart looks is on the vertical axis we have something we call a normalized IRI condition. Uh, basically it just means that a one is our best case scenario, whatever the best IRI we see on our network is. A zero is the opposite, whatever the worst case is. So IRI actually is better at, that, at a higher number in this case. It's sort of a little bit inverted from, from typical IRI. But it gives us sort of a clean way to look at the chart. Uh, all of the points, I'm sorry you can't really read the, the vertical axis and the horizontal axis numbers very well, but each of the points basically represents uh, for a given treatment in a, at a given age, so a, a certain amount of time after it was applied, what is the IRI of that treatment? What is the IRI of the location where that treatment was applied? Uh, we apply a little bit of a jitter so that you can see instead of just straight columns, you see a little bit more of a, a, a cloud of points that you can actually follow the line a little better. Um, but what this allowed us to do then was, was looking at a specific treatment family, looking at the actual evidence that says that's what that location's condition was at a given age, and then looking year over year, you can see the trend line, that red curve that we have there that actually tells us what we expect that family of treatment uh, to look like over time. You can see that there's a lot of noise. There's a, a fairly low correlation value to the data as far as the model that fits here. Uh, which you'd expect because there's gonna be a lot of variation in how treatments are applied. But this does give us something that we can use our historical evidence to arrive at, at an expected treatment curve value that we then plug into the model to give us those uh, benefit cost values that Nicole was talking about earlier. And that's all we have, I think. Any questions? Good then.